don't have a passport. Check your email. Sure. Uh, is it going to be smart enough for me to go run to my corner and get my computer here? I don't have my email. No. Um, whatever you need to do, yeah. I, I just... Yeah, we just need the, the link to the YouTube. Oh, I have work here. Oh, you work here? Right? Yeah, I went to school for film and video, so I mean, it, it Everybody fits in looks naturally. Young to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, I get confused with the students all the time. It's kind of a good good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, I didn't go to Cornell, but maybe some people think I did. <laughs> oh, here we go. Stream is live on YouTube. Yep, I know this, Charles.
I mean, are people on the live stream going to be able to uh, comment, like ask questions and stuff? Um, uh, it depends on the YouTube settings, which I can do double check in this email here. We got um, post caption, live replay number. Uh, I'm not able to tell from what information I have. Okay. Um, trying to get in contact with uh, Chuck Davis, who is on the YouTube end of things. He's inside the account, and he would, he'd know that. Yeah. Um, I think usually, like automatically, they don't have chat, but it could be enabled. Um, we'll see once we open it up. Oh, I got a phone number. Okay, great. Yeah, we're all uh, live on YouTube, so when Randy gets back, we can start. Or if you wanted to start anyway, we can do that. No, that's okay. I'm going to turn the mics on. And it looks like um, subscribers to the channel can comment and have live chat. Mm -hmm. Thanks, folks. We're just waiting on um, Randy. All right. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Yeah. Good? Good. Yeah. Is it going to snow tonight? No. I think it's going to be here. It's going to be a little south of us. South. Yeah. Is it snow water? Yeah. No. Yeah. It used to. It used to. Yeah. Really. It hasn't like. Yeah. 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 Through the door. Wow. Syracuse. Well, I used to live in Buffalo, of course, since yeah. there, yeah. Yeah. But for the same reason, Watertown, Temple Square, all of that, it's hit right, off, right at the end of the lake. Right, right. And it's funny, Syracuse Airport, it's sucked in. Syracuse, nothing, it's that, just a few miles. Just right inside the lake, yeah. 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 I'm sure it gets a little seasonal effective here in the, in the winter, though, right? No. I think he's getting a. Um, I drove from my home in uh, Mountain Lakes, New Jersey. Yeah, I drove from Virginia. Jeez. Wow. I'm staying in Scranton tonight. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> on the uh, Joe Biden tree? 
<laughs> I did see the Joe Biden freeway on the way up here, that's right. Not just the Joe Biden freeway, but the president. Joe Biden freeway. It was still fresh. You can see. <laughs> okay. All right. So we got we got the stream up and we're all ready to go. Oh. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. To, oh. Yeah, they had to clear your car. Well, I'd like to cut this in half for the first On behalf of the Heterodox Academy campus community in Cornell and Portland and the, our Please Include Society program, uh, I'm more than happy and out of breath to welcome Matt Taibbi. On March 9, 2023, Matt and Michael Schellenberger testified at a hearing before the United States House Committee on the Judiciary Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. His testimony was related to the Twitter files. Oddly enough, Matt received a visit from the IRS that same day. <laughs> Coincidence? No. <laughs> Matt tweeted, the great COVID-19 lie machine, Stanford and the Virality Project, and the censorship of true stories raises questions about the government and social media censorship. Matt released information from Twitter files on the Virality Project regarding the censorship of topics such as innate immunity, vaccine side effects, how vaccinated people still get COVID, the lab leak theory of the origin of COVID, and anything else that would exacerbate this trust in Dr. Fauci. During the hearing, the ranking member Stacy Plaskett called Matt so-called journalist. <laughs> Matt grew up in a newsroom because his dad, Mike Taibbi, was a TV journalist in Boston and New York City. And um, Matt responded to the kind of code words that Matt wrote about and hated reading. Uh, Matt said, Ranking member Plaska, I'm not a so-called journalist. I've won the National Magazine Award, the I.F. Stone Award for Independent Journalism, and I've written, written 10 books, including four New York Times bestsellers. The problem with Matt Taibbi is that he's nobody's fool. He's an independent journalism who does not tow either party's line. The I.F. Stone Award is also known as the Indy Award. And it honors independent journalism of I.F. Stone, the independent journalism of I.F. Stone for work outside of corporate control. The award is given by the Park Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College. And Matt was honored for his exceptional stories on media bias in conservative and liberal news that culminated in his book, Hate Inc. Um, Todd Shack and Raza Rooney. Mm -hmm. Todd's in Europe and Ross is in New York City. I know, I know. I got a text from them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they wouldn't love to have been here. In 1923, Matt was honored along with Barry Weiss and Michael Schellenberger with the inaugural Dow Prize for their stories on the Twitter Um, I thought, if only we could get such a great investigative journalist to Cornell, especially the, the let me say, so-called theme year for free expression. <laughs> on, seven, this, on September 22nd, Matt, pub, Matt published a challenge in Racket News where he said he would like to come to any progressive town, particularly if there was an appropriately hostile crowd, <laughs> and to hold a town hall discussion in what happened to, um, in terms of censorship. So, So um, my neighbor, Scott, who at one time probably thought I was an alt-right QAnon adjacent uh, 
whatever from my fight against DEI and my fight for free speech, um, came up to me and said, um, Matt, Taibbi says he'll come to any progressive town. Do you think you can make this work? And I said, geez. I know Nadine Strauss, and I know that she knows Matt Taibbi, so I'll call, I'll email and see what happens. And so thanks to Reed talking to Scott and getting to sign up for Racket, and Nadine, we have today. So without further ado, let me introduce Matt Taibbi, who once played left field for the Uzbek national baseball team. He played basketball in Mongolia. It was known as the Mongolian Rodman, who was a gonzo <laughs> journalist along the lines of Hunter S. Thompson and Tom Wolfe, and who was one of the original signatories of the Westminster Declaration, if you haven't seen it, look it up and sign it, that warns the public that an increasing censorship by governments and media companies would jeopardize freedom of speech, and who was actively fighting the elite war of free thought. Thanks, man. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, thank you to um, Rand, sorry, already making a mistake. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Rand, for that amazing introduction, and um, to Rick and to Liam and to everybody else who had a hand in inviting me. I guess it's Scott, who uh, helped make this happen. Um, believe it or not, when I was a little boy, I used to tell grown-ups that I was going to study zoology at Cornell someday. Um, then my life happened, and I never got here until now. So this is sort of a, a lifelong dream come true. And um, I really am very anxious to talk about this topic, and I'm, I'm so glad you all turned out. I hope it, uh, it ends up being interesting for all of us. Uh, for those who don't know, um, my name is Matt Taibbi. I've been reporting for about 35 years now, continuing a, a family tradition. My father was also a news reporter. He started when he was 17 or 18 years old, working at the Home News in Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, I was born shortly after that and grew up in newsrooms, as Rick mentioned. So I've been around this uh, business my whole life and watched it go through a lot of changes. Some not so positive in recent years. Uh, and then about a year ago, I, I had a most unusual experience. I had the journalistic equivalent of a Willy Wonka golden ticket uh, when the new owner of Twitter, Elon Musk, invited me to come out to San, San Francisco and essentially look through all the internal communications of one of the world's largest companies, largest corporations, something that never happens. Uh, we had a meeting where a row of horrified lawyers sat next to Elon and um, asked him questions like, uh, we're going to give him everything except to the privilege stuff, right? And he said, no, he can have that too. Uh, so I got to watch the blood drain from their faces, and <laughs> I knew this was an important story at once, but we had almost no supervision. Um, and because Twitter is a communications company, the internal uh, dialogues and emails and attachments that were involved uh, that we were allowed to go through gave us a window into all kinds of subjects that um, anything we really wanted to investigate. We could have looked at finance, taxation, um, politics, but uh, I think the real gold mine was law enforcement and intelligence, where we learned all kinds of things that none of us ever knew. And going into the project, we were really interested. I was the first person who was invited, but shortly after that, uh, there were a couple of others. Barry Weiss, who was a former New York Times uh, columnist. Michael Schellenberger, who um, had written a couple of books and had run for governor of California. He was there. There were a few other folks. Lee Fong, who um, is a very good, uh, terrific young investigative reporter. He worked for The Intercept. He was there. Um, we got together and uh, started looking through this material and very quickly realized that we were uh, looking at something very unusual and uh, started to follow uh, a series of email clues that led us to what we thought was kind of an important discovery. 
Um, now, back in 1974, a lot of people probably don't remember this, but there was a story in the New York Times that came to be known as the Family Jewel story. Uh, it was written by Seymour Hirsch, who was already at that point a, uh, a very famous investigative reporter in America because of his, his uncovering of the uh, My Lai Massacre story about Vietnam. But this story was about what he called a huge illegal domestic surveillance program that was run by the CIA. The essence of this story was about international intelligence agencies that had charters that specifically barred them from operating domestically, engaging in widespread uh, surveillance uh, at home, using informants, uh, attempting to infiltrate newspapers and doing other uh, what they call information operations. All of this was blatantly illegal. And this story, um, which was met with a lot of displeasure within the media community, believe it or not, and led to some recriminations against her, led, uh, was one of the factors that led to the uh, famous church committee hearings in the mid-70s. Mid Anybody remember, you heard about that situation? So this was... One of the things that led to uh, wide-scale reforms of the CIA, FBI, led to uh, rules against things like political assassinations, the beginning of political investigations without predicate, that sort of thing. And I thought what we had found in the Twitter files was similar to this. In fact, I consulted with Hirsch himself about this material at the time because I was very nervous about what we were looking at. And uh, he generally agreed with me that it was in the same ballpark. Uh, of course, he thought his story was better. Um, but, uh, but we thought it was important. And when we started publishing this, I was convinced. I grew up a kind of a standard issue ACLU liberal. I was I'm old enough to have remembered the Parents Music Resource Center uh, controversies of the uh, mid-'80s when Frank Zappa and E. Snyder took on Tipper Gore and uh, the effort to label rock music records. Uh, and I remember the lawsuit by Jerry Fall, I'm sorry, by uh, Larry Flint and Penthouse Magazine against um, Jerry Falwell and the Moral Majority. Basically every speech controversy from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, this was a litmus test issue for people who were progressive or liberal at the time. You, you were always in favor and I thought all the people uh, who were of my same age range and the same background, that they would see this material and they would be as angry and upset and scared as I was, because there was a lot of new stuff that was really scary. And um, to all of our surprise, when we put this out, we not only um, didn't get that kind of reaction, we got the exact opposite reaction. There was an intense media campaign against all of us. There were, there were um, hit pieces written about each one of the people written, uh, who worked in the Twitter file story. When we testified um, in the hearing that Randy mentioned, I was actually get, uh, sent a letter afterwards and threatened with um, a five-year jail sentence because there was an error in my testimony, a typo. Uh, so, we had exactly the opposite reaction that we expected, and this, this has become, for, for me, because I've spent the last year working on this story, and it's a very complicated and difficult uh, topic that it turn, turns out has a lot of background, the lack of reaction by traditional defenders of free speech has become one of the unanswered questions of this whole story. Like, why, why did that happen? And so. Uh, I'm really interested in sort of going you know, door to door around the country and finding out what's going on. Why, why do people feel that way? I want to start arguments about this and be challenged about it. And so that's the idea of, the, of um, this presentation. I'm going to go through very as quickly as I can some of the material, and then hopefully we can open up uh, the floor for discussion. And I, I'm serious. I want to be challenged about this stuff. 
I've done a, a few of these events already, and the closest we've come to that actually is a uh, performance artist who did a primal scream uh, in Park Slope. It was actually pretty good. Uh, until I ran into that guy in Washington. Funny, but it was very sarcastic. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good. Uh, he cleverly left his script behind afterwards. And, um, but, uh, but nobody is really, we haven't yet, um, I haven't yet gotten to the heart of the matter. What happened to, you know, America's traditional concern about speech rights. This used to be something that we were deeply uh, concerned about. I lived in Russia for many, many years, and I remember being um, so proud, you know, that this is the one thing that kind of sets Americans apart from all other types of people around the world, is that we insist on our right to say anything. We don't allow anybody else to tell us uh, what to say or think. And this is something that we all grew up with. It's ingrained in our character or was until recently. So I want to get to the heart of why that has happened and what's changed. And hopefully we can discuss a little bit about that today. We're live streaming, as I understand, and so people can send in questions as well. So let's just get to it. All right, so um, this is just something I wanted to give for background to this whole speech issue. I mentioned before the parents you know, of the PMRC, Zappa, Dee Snyder, uh, Robert Maplethorpe scandal, People versus Larry Flynn, everybody remembers those incidents. This is the most on point incident from back then. Though. This is um, 1989, NWA put out its famous record, uh, Straight Outta Compton, with, with the single F the Police. Everybody remembers that, I'm sure. Uh, and the FBI sent a letter to the label that put out that album. And you can see it's a very polite, handwritten, personalized letter from an FBI official saying, advocating violence and assault is wrong, uh, music plays a significant role in society, and I wanted you to be aware of the FBI's position, etc., etc., etc. It didn't order them to stop doing it. It was a polite ask, uh, but still it came from the FBI, so that carries a certain connotation. This became a major national news phenomenon. You can see that the uh, Washington Post covered it, the New York Times covered it, the LA Times covered it. I was actually an intern at the Village Voice not long before this uh, was written. I had, I had a desk right around the corner from the famed uh, first, uh, free speech First Amendment columnist Nat Hentoff. And this was the kind of thing that animated liberal America once upon a time. The mere idea that the FBI could send one letter to one record company was outrageous. It was thought of as crossing a big line. And why is that important? Because the Twitter files is that story times about a million, basically. Uh, they systematized this activity, and they did it not just with big record labels and, and music groups and rap groups, but with tiny accounts of people with as few as six followers. So just going back to the beginning, how we found the story, we started going through um, communications involved in the 2020 election. And we started seeing things like this. Right? There would be a Slack chat, and there would be a headline, FBI referral, land erection to central activity. Finish review on the IPs flagged by FBI. And then there'd be like a list, like a long list. Um, and it turned out that the FBI was routinely sending Twitter through a variety of channels, not just one, through uh, these long lists of accounts. Sometimes they were just numbers for accounts. Sometimes they were screenshots of individual tweets. They came in all different shapes and sizes. But the essence of it was, we're flagging this, we're sending this to you, we want you to look at it. Sometimes they sent spreadsheets. Uh, we found these as long as three or 4,000 entries. In other cases, um, there were letters that came through the FBI portal, and this is going to be hard to explain, but uh, did not come from the FBI. There is something called the FITF, the Foreign Influence Task Force. They developed a system by which all requests or referrals or flags that came from anywhere in the federal government 
That could be the U.S. Treasury. That could be the Department of Health and Human Services. It could be the CIA. It could be the Defense Intelligence Agency, the State Department, anything. That would come through the FITF. The FITF is actually a, uh, a multi-agency task force, primarily led by the FBI, but it also has the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, and as an umbrella group, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. So, the FBI FITF essentially became the portal through which things like this came. Now, we're not sure, but I asked a former CIA agent uh, if he could guess where this came from, this particular format with the tail line in the middle. That's kind of typical of a foreign intelligence service. He thought it was CIA, we can't be sure. But essentially, uh, this was a um, communication that was probably meant for YouTube, but it was circulated to, to a bunch of the platforms. And they're highlighting what they call anti-Ukraine narratives. So uh, I bring this up, I included this for a couple of reasons, but it's important to note that the public perception is that these flags are all about disinformation, about error. But we learn very quickly that that's not the case. They were flagging all sorts of things, and they had a very um, expansive de definition of what error was. That could mean uh, going against uh, a certain government position, being undermining the authority of a government official, or going against the narrative that the government um, approved of or disapproved of. So in this case, they were asking YouTube to flag a long list of, uh, of videos. This was another one that seemed to come from a foreign intelligence service, which was directed towards Twitter. It was a more elaborate uh, report. And uh, they would send long lists. You can see, um, well, I'm going to get to this in a second. But they would um, tell you about themes that they were concerned about. Uh, sort of the idea that there were neo-Nazis in Ukraine. They didn't like that. Um, they didn't like the idea of uh, people talking about Joe Biden's son's relationship with Ukraine. And I say this as someone who has no partisan interest in either any of this stuff. But this was something that we found, that they were talking about these issues. Then we found this, and this was the this was the moment about three and a half weeks into the project where we realized that this was a bigger deal than, than we thought. This is what you call um, an industry meeting email. You see basically what it is. Uh, there will be a, um, this, this is actually from the FITF, and it's two that Nathaniel Bletcher is an executive at uh, at Facebook, and there's a Twitter executive, and there are 31 more people on the list. That included more than two dozen other companies. So there were companies like Wikimedia in there, Pinterest, uh, and essentially all of these companies were invited to participate in what they call the industry meeting, which was originally a monthly thing, and then as it got closer to the 2020 election, it became a weekly thing. They would be briefed on themes, things to look out for uh, by a series of government agencies. And you can see here that first uh, there's a briefing on the IRA, which is the Russian Internet Research Agency. But then there's a thing called the OGA briefing, which OGA is a euphemism, stands for other, other government agencies, tends to represent the intelligence community generally, often the CIA specifically. We learned that the CIA was often auditing these meetings, so they would have people there, they wouldn't participate sometimes, sometimes they did participate. And you can see that it's signed by the FBI agent, Ella Bulbas Chan, at the bottom. But they would go through all these different topics and say, here's what we think about all these different things, keep that in mind. Ahead of the 2020 election, they were sending so many accounts for Twitter to review that they were apologizing for the workload. Uh, so here's that list of 132, uh, 132 accounts we sent you. Um, thanks for any help that can be given, and I apologize in advance for adding to your work. So they were doing this a lot. This I wanted to add just so people understand that they were not just flagging conservatives and Trump supporters. 
In fact, I would say it's barely um, a preponderance in that direction, but there were an awful lot of groups that were uh, left-leaning. Here, you can see, this is a group that I, I think they were supposed to be sympathizers of um, South American leftists that they, they were looking at. Uh, but Pure Doubt, which is an American kind of left-leaning site, they were on this list. And they found this. Uh, Helen Porter, the FBI, once the system got more formalized, they set up a, a regular system where it's kind of like Mission Impossible. Whenever the FITF, the FBI, wanted to send something to Twitter, they would send it through this special box called Teleporter. And if uh, the people on the other end didn't take it out uh, in a certain time period, it would kind of vanish. If you do not read this, it will self-destruct. Very 1970s or 60s, it's, uh, it's kind of cool. Um, again, more of uh, just basic there's different types of these lists. You can see sometimes it's names, sometimes it's accounts, sometimes they'll actually tell you what's in the tweet, sometimes not. Um, right, so the, they would tell you uh, that we're, the FBI is sharing information on behalf not just of the FBI, but the USIC components, so that's the intelligence community, uh, and they would ask permission to create separate channels through which they could talk about this securely. This was an important email that we found. This is the one that outlined the system I talked about before. They basically created a two-tiered system. So domestic complaints that came from any government entity that would be as small as a mayor's office um, or a rural police department, that would go through uh, the Department of Homeland Security and anything that came from a federal agency, and that could be as big as the Department of Defense, that would go through the FBI. So you can see the FBI talking about that. We can give you everything we're seeing from the FBI and the intelligence community agencies, CISA, which is a Homeland Security Open Operation, the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency. Their motto is, we care about security so much, you put it in our title twice. Um, <laughs> CISA will know what's going on in each state, uh, and then they offer uh, to Twitter, we want to be the um, industry partners, uh, we want the FBI to be the belly button for the USG. So everything would go through the belly button of the FBI. And again, more, more of these um, spreadsheets. This was another important one. Anyone here heard of the Canadian journalist Aaron Maté? We found this kind of late. Uh, this was a list that was forwarded by the FBI from the SBU, which is the Ukrainian Secret Service. They sent a list of uh, hundreds of sites. Most of them were Russian. Um, I've underlined a couple of them just because they're interesting. This is Komsomolskaya Pravda, which um, is a newspaper, it used to be the world's largest newspaper. I worked under it, uh, on the floor underneath it when I was a journalist in Russia. Uh, not a particularly radical organization. This is the Communist Party of the, of the Russian Federation. Here's the uh, Russian um, uh, Interior Ministry, sorry, not Interior Ministry, the, um, essentially the Russian State Department. So they wanted that, all those things to be gone. Uh, but in addition to that, they wanted a removal of Aaron Mate. And um, they used very graphic language uh, in plainly asking, um, you see, as these accounts that are suspected by the SBU and spreading fear and subordination for your review and consideration, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to Twitter's credit, they ended up not removing Aaron Mate. They actually wrote the FBI a letter back saying, we kind of can't remove a well-known Canadian journalist just because Ukrainian spies say so. Uh, but the fact that the FBI thought that was appropriate should tell you a little bit about where they think, what they think their role is. Now we get to the Global Engagement Center. How many people have ever heard of the Global Engagement Center until recently? Not many, right? Um, I've never heard of it. It turns out the Global Engagement Center is a 
wing of the State Department that was created by an executive order in Barack Obama of last year. They are dedicated to countering foreign disinformation, and there's an interesting twist to that that I'm going to get to in a minute. But it's uh, essentially an in-house anti-disinformation intelligence service that's housed in the State Department. It has some other components that it doesn't talk about publicly. But they were sending a lot of letters to Twitter asking for uh, removal or just sort of offering general recommendations about different kinds of accounts. Uh, one of the uh, sites that they were concerned about was Zero Hedge. Anyone know that site? Yeah. Uh, so, one of the things that they would do, they would say, uh, finally, the suspension of the Zero Edge Twitter account led to another flurry of disinformation narratives. Uh, Zero Edge's most recent posts received high engagement and focused on supposedly organic matter burning in Wuhan. So they were upset that people on Twitter were complaining that Twitter had removed Zero Edge. So the State Department, which is, has a specific remit to only worry about um, Foreign news it has no domestic uh, role at all, if you look at this charter, was monitoring American social media activity, and they were upset about people who were upset about the removal of Zero Hedge. And they were putting this in formal reports that were sent to Twitter. Um, they sent, not just to Twitter, but to all of the major uh, internet platforms, a list of 5,500 names that they said were, um, they called it their China list. They said these were Chinese disinformation agents. When people actually looked closely, they found that there were like three employees of CNN on it, a whole bunch of Canadian diplomats. The whole thing was riddled with errors. But this was a, a common uh, technique, was that they would send these lists to news agencies first, and then they would send the list to Twitter. And the idea here, was to put pressure on the internet platform and say, hey, if you don't take this stuff down, you're going to get more of this negative publicity. And very oftentimes, uh, Twitter would buckle, or they would compromise, and they would take down a portion of, of, the, of the accounts. But this is just a very clever technique they used to use to try to pressure the company into acting. Gek also created a... Um, a very fascinating and terrifying concept called the information ecosystem. Now the idea here is if you're tweeting and you have a social media account and your opinions are too in sync with somebody they consider a foreign adversary, then they will consider you part of that ecosystem. So that is how um, you know, former high-ranking, uh, I think it's the former prime minister of Italy, uh, and the former head of the Italian Democratic Party, both ended up uh, listed in Gek's uh, Russian information ecosystem. So it's a guilt by association thing. You don't have to have any contact with Russia. You don't have to have any uh, stated approval for Russian policies. You just have to believe or retweet the same kinds of stories that for instance, the Russian Foreign Ministry, or Maria Zakharova, is tweeting, and you can end up on this list very easily. So this is guilt by association concept that uh, they developed quite early. This is the Election Integrity Partnership. This we discovered, um, it was a body that was run out of Stanford University, and it was, its purpose was to review election-related material in 2020. The idea for it came from the Department of Homeland Security. We didn't learn that until well after the Twitter file was already been published. Actually, it was only because the House Judiciary Committee subpoenaed more information that they, that they, they learned absolutely that that was the origin uh, of this group. But they were openly partnered uh, with both the Department of Homeland Security and um, the Global Engagement Center, uh, as well as four different uh, academic institutions. And what they did is they created uh, what they call uh, tickets, 
for um, in the system called JIRA, these were disinformation events, and they would pass on these tickets. There would be sort of a centralized uh, information sharing platform where all of the different uh, internet platforms could see what had been flagged by the EIP. Now that you can see, they only processed 639 different tickets, but each one of those tickets might represent a URL uh, that could be on thousands of different pages. So, this is actually in the report. One ticket could contain thousands of URLs collected. So they were flagging an awful lot of stuff. And um, here again, here's, the, here's the, the material that was dug up by the House Organization Committee. It's a letter from the Atlantic Council uh, talking about how the EIP we, made, we created at the request of DHS CISA. Here's the EIP's own list of partners. All right, so the Elections Infrastructure uh, ISAC. I'm not going to get into what that acronym means, but again, here you see um, CISA. The C over there is cut off, but that's the State Department. Uh, so this is a quasi-public, quasi-private group. Uh, they actually talk about one, one of the members of the EIP said, well, we have to do this because there are, um, there are gaps in the ability of, the, of Homeland Security to do this legally. They don't exactly have the funding to do it. So uh, we're, we're an appropriate resolution in the meantime. They talked about how um, uh, we're not so concerned about infringing on the First Amendment because we're not a government actor. When the EIP's research director gave a speech, oops, sorry. There were notes next to one of her speeches saying unclear legal authorities, including very real First Amendment questions, which is interesting because they denied to us that there were any First Amendment issues. When we found the successor project to this, which is the rally project, uh, we started to find things like this. Um, and this is this concept of flagging things that aren't false, uh, but are objectionable in some other way. So prior to this new digital anti-disinformation era, journalists like me, we lived according to the system where if you got in trouble, the courts would punish the speech, not the speaker, right? If you committed libel, uh, you would have to remunerate the victim they would issue a retraction, but there wouldn't be like a scarlet letter on your forehead that said you are a purveyor of misinformation and you can't work in media anymore. The whole idea was to encourage people who worked in media to be better, right? So if you, committed a, if you made a mistake, the idea was to not do it again, get better, get right back in the saddle, keep working. That's not how this system works. This system looks at people and decides that uh, indi certain individuals are more or less prone to committing misinformation. So you can see known repeat offenders, also reading uh, misleading quotes from the accounts of well-known repeat offenders such as Robert F. Kennedy Jr. or Sherry uh, Tenpenny. This is a large volume of content that is almost always reportable. So again, they're working backwards. You start with the person, the person's probably wrong, you look at their posts, you report their posts. Then we found all kinds of things uh, that, in, that fell under the category of what they call malinformation. What's malinformation? They have uh, a, cat, a subcommittee in Homeland Security called the MDM subcommittee. That's misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. I would never heard of malinformation. Has anyone ever heard that from that before last year? You had? Okay, I had. Um, malinformation is just uh, information that is factually true, but misleading, or um, brings people to an adverse political reaction. So, you can take an example. You have these ongoing themes that would be issued in these reports. And these were actually public. You didn't have to go to the Twitter file to find this, but um, they would say notable vaccine side effects, uh, adverse event stories. And they talked about um, an elderly black woman who had died after receiving the vaccine. Now this is a true story, 
It actually happened, but they highlighted it as a misinformation or malinformation event because the majority of the comments in the story are anti-vaccine. So once again, they're, they're starting with the exact opposite concept that journalism always operates on. We, we were always taught, if it's true, put it out there, who cares? It's not our job to worry about what it means. It's our job to get it right. It's the public's job to interpret it. They think of it in the exact opposite way. They think we have to worry about how people interpret this stuff. Whether it's true or not doesn't matter. Here, here's another one, and this is interesting for a very important reason. CDC reports 5,800 breakthrough cases of people getting coronavirus after vaccination. Some medical freedom Facebook groups and anti-vax activists have seized this data to suggest the vaccines are ineffective. Takeaway, as journalists and medical professionals have urged, the media should emphasize the rarity of breakthrough infections while reporting on these extremely rare events. Does anyone want to guess when that was published, that report? Right, so this was in that sweet spot between the development of the vaccine and when it became public and the moment when they started to realize that breakthrough infections weren't actually rare at all. So this is them talking about malinformation when they themselves are factually incorrect, which we found out was not an uncommon phenomenon at all. It happened quite a bit. Now we come to a couple of doctors who are at the center of a very important legal case. Excuse me. Um, anyone here heard of Dr. Jay Bhattacharya? Yes. Yeah. He was here. He was here? All right, Jay's one of my heroes. So is um, Martin Kolbar from Harvard, Jason Stanford. Uh, one of the first things we found uh, in the Twitter files, the very first day we were there, was this. Uh, this was, we were given access to what they call the PB2 viewer, which is like the personal, it's kind of like the personal overview page of each individual account holder. If you were a Twitter executive and wanted to be sneaky and say, what the merits exist on this or that person's file, you call up the folder, and you see that Jay Bhattacharya has all these little entries here. Recent abuse strike, trans blacklist. Okay? And this was the first uh, hint that we had. Uh, it was the first concrete proof of what everyone knows as shadow banning. Uh, they had actually done an entry at Twitter um, Get what the headline was. It was really funny, like setting the record straight on shadow banning. Do we shadow ban? We do not, right? That was how it started. But they do. They have a whole series of these techniques that call, um, they call it denial listing. Uh, for short, sometimes they call it just bots, right? We'll, we'll stick a bot on a person. Trends blacklist means this account cannot trend under any circumstances. And there's a whole galaxy of these different tools. They can dial the person all the way up to everybody in the world sees it, and they can dial the person all the way down to nobody sees it, not even the people who follow that account, which is actually the situation I'm currently in. Um, but uh, Trends Blacklist is, you know, it's basically meant that uh, Jay, whose crime was that he had done an early series of studies in Santa, Santa Clara, suggesting that the WHO and American health authorities had massively overstated uh, the infection fatality rate of COVID uh, and, um, and that they had undercounted the rapidity with which people were getting infected. It was an indication that lockdowns and masking wasn't working as well as they thought. Uh, he was kept from trending. Kaldorf, who among other things, um, he had advised American health authorities for two decades. He's from Sweden. He had looked at peer-reviewed studies from his home country, which is one of the only countries in the world that didn't do school closures. And um, he was tweeting about this. And uh, he was actually suppressed for both reasons. He was suppressed for being pro and anti-vax. Uh, which is the, uh, one of the most unusual situations um, that we found. Uh, Kohldorf, uh, when one of the vaccines came out, he, he was, um, 
advocating that even though there had been some reports of adverse effects that the disease was dangerous enough, dangerous enough for people over a certain age range that they should take the vaccine anyway. He got demerited for that. Uh, then he got demerited for suggesting that children and healthy people under a certain age shouldn't take the vaccine. Um, when both of these gentlemen got together and they signed something called the Great Barrington Declaration, which was uh, turned out to be signed by over a million people, and it essentially said uh, that we think lockdowns are ineffective uh, and are not good policy, and as scientists, we can endorse them. You can see this is a letter that also came out later due to a congressional investigation. This is um, a letter to Anthony Fauci from Francis Collins at the NIH. The proposal from the three fringe epidemiologists, uh, the third was from Oxford, so you had Oxford, Harvard, and Stanford, they were fringe. This proposal from the three fringe epidemiologists who met with the secretary seems to be getting a lot of attention. There needs to be a quick and devastating, devastating published takedown of its premises. I don't see anything like that online yet. Is, under, is it underway? Uh, so I bring that up to point out that um, Martin and Jay are now part of a very important lawsuit that's going to be argued before the Supreme Court uh, this year, Missouri v. Biden, that you don't have to be wrong. Um, to be subject to deamplification or removal from any of these accounts. You don't have to be wrong to garner the attention of public uh, officials. You just have to do something that contravenes uh, government policy. Uh, and they would call it uh, increasing vaccine hesitancy. Uh, they had all these code words for this. And um, as a result, you would often get these letters asking the various platforms uh, to take down these accounts, even though they were not factually incorrect. And this is one of the examples, this is an exhibit from that lawsuit. It's a letter from Facebook, uh, sorry, a letter to a Facebook official from uh, somebody in the Biden White House, uh, Andy Slavitt, and Rob Flaherty, who's another executive who shows up a lot in this stuff. Uh, talking about you know, increasing what they call levers for tackling vaccine hesitancy content. And they, they say it right out in the open, this is often true content, which we allow at the post level because ex experts have advised us that it is important for people to be able to discuss their personal experiences and concerns, but it can be framed as sensation, alarmist, or shocking. We will remove these groups, pages, and accounts when they are disproportionately promoting this sensationalized content. So what do you think we're saying? They're openly saying this stuff is true, will allow people to talk about it amongst themselves in small groups, but if it starts to take off, then we'll clamp down on it. Um, and this is this is communication to the White House. This is from another group called the CPI League. Um, this was another, what they call it, it was a volunteer organization. It's a little bit like uh, the Election Integrity Partnership. I'm going to just skip through this mainly, but the important thing here is that the CPI League, which was also associated with the Department of Homeland Security uh, and was endorsed uh, actually specifically by Christopher Krebs, who was the head of CISA at the time, this group issued uh, instructions to all of the volunteers who worked in CTI League and gave them instructions on the use of burner emails and phone numbers. You should create a false persona, a spy disguise for research, a fleshed out human being that has details. You should, your OPSEC should be good, lock your shit down, they say. Um, and they, the whole idea was to create sock puppet accounts on Twitter and Facebook in order to get into invite-only groups for things like the Blue Blue Boys. Uh, and this is um, not CTI League offensive counterintelligence, it's just a few people. Uh, we want to use techniques using doxing and deception. And later on, they talk about using the same um, uh, techniques as what they call the adversary. And here's another thing from, from one of their, <laughs> this one was amazing. So this is, a, this is from one of their initial uh, letters 
informing them on other, other techniques that they want to use. And there's a quote from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now remember, these people are supposed to be anti-disinformation experts. They're, the whole idea is it's supposed to be this socially beneficial thing that um, encourages better discourse in the public, and yet they're quoting the Pentagon um, as an authority on this. And they're talking about the use of countermeasures. Countermeasures that are, are, are that form of military science that, but that by the employment of devices and or techniques is designed to impair the operational effect, effectiveness of enemy activity that can be active or passive or deployed preemptively. And this is something that um, is something that we're studying now, this idea of preemptive action. They call it pre-bunking. And that's when you put out a story that can be not true, but the whole idea of it is to seed the public with an idea that immunizes them against the later truth coming out. And this has happened actually with some stories that I've done recently. There were other stories that were leaked years ago that were designed to implant uh, sort of countervailing ideas in the population. We'll get to that later, but I'm going to skip from here to another por portion of this, which is the origin of all this activity. Now, when we started doing this research, one of the things, questions we had to answer was, where did this come from? What, what is anti-disinformation? We started to see all this terminology that, as journalists, we weren't familiar with. Um, there was jargon that you would look up on the internet and not see anywhere. So we started to look at the origins and the, uh, the background, the genealogy of some of these organizations. And the one absolutely concrete, irrefutable fact I can tell you about the anti-disinformation complex is that it is a product of the war on terror. This all grew out of uh, stuff that began after 9-11 in that flurry of activity that started with the Patriot Act, uh, continued on with things like Guantanamo Bay Prison, the end of habeas corpus, drone assassination, all of that. Uh, Anti-disinformation is a descendant uh, of these programs. I'm going to walk you through this quickly and we'll be coming on that source. So, um, National security letters, many people know what those are. Um, it's an amazing phenomenon, right? Uh, national security letters. It's, it's, it's incredible that not more people don't know about this. So uh, after 9-11, the FBI have, um, started to use this new tool, national, national security letter, where they can basically send a letter to any uh, public, any, any company, um, that performs any kind of service and say for national security reasons we need access to the internal files of this person, we need this person's communications data, we need this person's health information, whatever it is. And not only that, um, we're, we're going to impose a gag order on you. You are prevented by law from telling your customer that we have turned over this information to you. Uh, so you have no Fifth Amendment ability to contest uh, this kind of search at all. They were doing it tens of thousands of times a year. There have been multiple uh, inspector general uh, um, investigations of this. They've been chided over and over again to stop doing it, and they keep doing it. Um, this I wanted to bring up because this is an example of what we call an information operation, an offensive information operation. In, in the Twitter files, we started to see a little bit Every now and then we would see references to offensive IOs, and we didn't know what that meant, so we started to call it out. We found that offensive IOs are basically when the United States plants a story somewhere overseas. Now, they used to have to do it overseas, uh, but in very rare occasions they would do it at home. And this is one of the most famous episodes. In 1986, the um, Admiral Poindexter in the Reagan administration wanted to make Gaddafi worried about an internal um, uh, revolt. So they planted news stories in the Wall Street Journal to the effect 
that uh, he was about to be facing an internal revolution. And they knew that it wasn't true, that it was fake intelligence. And Poindexter, I guess, or somebody close to him happened to mention this to Bob Woodward, who kind of broke the code a little bit and talked about it publicly. And as a result of this, we learned that the United States does this, that they will plant news stories for political reasons that they know to be untrue in American newspapers. Uh, but that's a very rare example. That was, you know, at the time, that really stood out. Now, this was a more uh, famous case, a nation challenge, secret sites. Iraqi tells of renovations uh, at sites for chemical and nuclear arms. My own news, uh, magazine, Rolling Stone, did a story about this story in 2005. It turned out that this, was, this story was based on a whistleblower uh, who had been developed by the CIA who had failed a polygraph in Thailand, uh, but after he failed the polygraph, the CIA was undeterred. They, they turned to a, um, a contractor who had a, a Pentagon contract at an office in uh, the D.C. area. That contractor set up Judy Miller uh, with another interview with this same uh, whistleblower who had failed the polygraph. And they got news into the New York Times from this very dubious source that Saddam Hussein was uh, renovating sites for chemical nuclear weapons. So that's one of the ways that they used to generate fake news. Now the difference, the, the key to this whole thing, is that once upon a time, because of the laws that govern foreign intelligence, they had to do this overseas. They, they always had to involve an interview that took place somewhere outside the United States, it would filter back through uh, some other foreign news agency. In this case, it was the Australian Broadcasting Corporation that did the interview, and then it got its way to the New York Times from there. Um, but never directly. We never directly propagandized, or we weren't supposed to do that. So that was the difference. Um, now, this is a, uh, a recruitment video that was created by a, a an agency called CSCC, and forgive me, I'm having um, an acronym seizure, but basically this is a, this is a group with something counter, um, counter disinformation, uh, but they created a, um, an ironic uh, ad for ISIS, and it was essentially like, come join ISIS, and you'll learn how to uh, kill Muslims, and kill other Muslims, and blow people up, et cetera, et cetera. I would play this video for you, but it's, it's loud and horrible. Uh, this got out, that we had produced this video. It became the butt of jokes um, uh, by John Oliver, uh, who basically was saying, like, what idiot in the United States government thinks that uh, it's going to be effective to try to propagandize ISIS recruits uh, using sarcasm, that they're going to catch that distinction. Um, well, the CSCC, oops, oops. sorry, uh, the CSCC, it turns out, turned into deck, right? So after that fiasco with John Oliver and they got all the bad press, uh, they reconstituted at the Global Engagement Center. It's a 10 interagency work task force. You can see that it's involved USAID, CIA, DARPA, the NSA, uh, Department of Justice, SOCOM, AFRICOM, and this group got together to create this new anti-disinformation agency that would be housed in the State Department. And instead of propagandizing you know, ISIS recruits, and this group, CSCC, had been created for a specific reason, because we had a problem with basically with white kids in suburban London or Southern California who were listening to uh, propaganda on the internet. And we wanted to deal with that by counter-propagandizing. And it was a really dumb program. Most of what we did is either make videos like that or have people type in broken Arabic, you know, half-witty responses to things that people were saying online. It wasn't very effective. 
And they, but they always operated in a foreign language, and they always did it overseas. Yeah. It was created to operate in English, and it was created to target audiences at home. And this is when I talked to one of the people from GEC, who's no longer there, who left for a variety of reasons, and he said, we made a switch um, in around 2016, called it CT to CP, counterterrorism, counterpopulism. And this was preceded by Occupy Wall Street, uh, the Tea Party, but then also the series of uh, populist movements that rose in Europe. There was Podemos, there was Syriza, there were, there were movements on the right and the left, uh, Brexit, Catalan independence movement. They didn't like any of this stuff, uh, but they particularly didn't like Donald Trump. And the first, one of the first heads of GEC is Richard, Richard Stengel, who, believe it or not, is the former editor of Time magazine. And he wrote a book called Information Wars, where he talked about how we have to bring our information wars home. Uh, all three of them, ISIS, Putin, and Trump, weaponized by the grievances of people who felt left out by modernity. Uh, the information battles we've been fighting far away had come home, and we had to bring them. And that's how they came up with this idea of the propaganda ecosystem. And so you'll see that they'll, they divide these things up into different kinds of misinformation or malinformation actors. So on one extreme end, there's the official government communication from the Kremlin. Um, on the other end, there might be the unwitting proliferators of Russian narrative, which is probably me for all I know, right? Local language specific outlets. Um, and they were flagging this stuff. Europe now has a, a law, the Digital Services Act, which is specifically uh, engaged to put series of, put people who are called trusted flaggers in charge of grabbing misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, non-socially beneficial information. The, the genesis of the DSA came after terrorist attacks in, in Paris, um, and uh, I don't know what the other place was, the Hague, maybe I can't remember where, where but uh, it was in 2015. But this law was actually uh, signed last year, and now if companies do not go along with this arrangement. And the whole idea is there is an off-site uh, group of these trusted flaggers who are chosen by the European Commission who go through content. And it can be at a very granular level. Again, from, from what we saw in America, they were looking at tiny, tiny accounts. Same thing overseas. Uh, if the companies don't follow the recommendations of these so-called tr trusted flaggers, they face basically uh, uh, fines that are so punitive that, that companies can't survive it. Um, this I can skip over, but, but essentially Google in uh, 2017 changed its algorithm uh, so that now there would be an emphasis on what they call authoritative content. They, they changed things around so that um, the example I was given was, and I, I talked to Google about this, if, you, if before you search for baseball, it would give you your local li Little League, now when you search for baseball, it gives you MLB.com. Uh, another example would be if you search for Trotskyism in the old days, it might, it might give you the World Socialist website, which is the world's leading Trotskyite publication. Now you will get a New York Times article about Trotskyism. Right? So they're looking for an authoritative uh, organization, and that's why you see always when you do searches, certain kinds of outlets are upranked and certain ones are downranked, even if they're more on the nose topic-wise. This is from a FOIA request that, uh, that we did after the FOIA files um, on one of the research institutions that uh, was creating a program like this Trusted Flaggers program, and I bring this up only to point out that there's a major class element to all of this. Uh, the people who do the actual reviewing uh, had to have a master's degree education, 
uh, in one of the relevant fields, political science, data science, sociology, or humanities. And the people who did the prep work, who actually just got the posts ready to be looked at, even they had to have bachelor's degrees. So there are no poor people who are in the anti-disinformation business. They're the people who are being censored. They're not involved in this work at all. They're completely left out of it. And maybe a lot of people don't care because they will say, well, you know, they're not subject matter experts. They don't know what's misinformation or not. Well, I mean, I think there's a reason why uh, there's, there are lots of problems with that. One of them being, if you look at the history of journalism, a lot of the best journalists you know, don't come from rich backgrounds, don't have great educations. In fact, a lot of them didn't even go to school. You know, the history of our country, journalists tend to come from, you know, a small family that had a printing press in, in a town, and you know, they didn't go to school for journalism, they didn't do, they weren't educated in the traditional way, they just knew how to do the printing, they knew how to do the distribution. Uh, that has changed dramatically over the years, that's one of the themes that I wrote about in Hate Inc., is this dramatic shift in class, in reporting, but it is also true in the anti disinformation world. There are, there are no middle class people uh, doing this kind of stuff. Um, I, this, is, this is just a slide I thought it was interesting. Ira Glasser, who's the kind of famous uh, former head of the ACLU, he was once asked why um, he didn't care for speech codes on campuses. And he was talking to a group of um, black students who were asked, you know, who were asking him, how can we be against hate speech codes? And he says, the issue isn't the speech. It isn't what, um, what you're looking to outlaw. The issue is who's doing the outlawing, who's doing the judging, right? And in your case, in the case of any university, it's going to be trustees from the university, it's going to be people who are chosen by the, by the leadership. Um, who's doing the flagging, who's doing the siding? You ask yourself that question, you said most of the time, it ain't you. And that's kind of the essence of what we found out with all this stuff. I mean, I could go over more material, but I, I wanted to stress that one point that, you know, really, in the end, the answer to this information thing is about who's doing it. Who's doing it? Mostly it's coming from governments, it's coming from intelligence services, it's coming from the Pentagon. The Pentagon has enormous sums of money devoted not only to their own in-house programs, but to programs that they're funding outside. Um, National Science Foundation, the State Department, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, they're funding all of these organizations and those organizations are hiring a very specific kind of person to look through this content. Uh, and they have very particular ideas about what is and is not misinformation. So uh, it's created this kind of information dichotomy. There are people who participate in this new form of digitized censorship, and you know, I think it's pretty serious. I think it's similar to the Family Jewel story, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you all have to think about it, and I would love to talk about it some more. So uh, does anyone have any? Yes, sir. Probably. Mm -hmm. So one or two, that mm -hmm. microphone. Okay, we need two. I think this all started when the principle of silence, silence, speech, speech violence. is violence, violence is speech, and silence is violence. If you don't speak out against something that's bad, you are committing violence against something. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, I think there, there's also this idea that um, but there's no such thing as in inconsequential opinion, right? Like you know, allowing somebody to say something that you disagree with. That used to be part of our whole modus operandi, right? It's this whole you know, confluence of opinion. They don't see it that way. They see that as contributing statistically to a problem. Like even one you know, person, an extra person dies of COVID because of your wrong opinions about that thing. It has to be stopped. 
So there's like a you know new knack about it. But that, that's an interesting you know, idea. Silence of Violence stood out to me, and I, I saw a lot about people being banned, punished, censored, what things that they did say. So I would love to hear more about how the Silence of Violence idea would do this in what you know, It might not be best to use as you would say that. But well, I mean, I think it, it doesn't come out as much in. One thing, a phenomenon that you do see in social media, it's harder to track than this, but people are always, there, there's an emphasis now on these outward manifestations of agreement. Right? I mean, the classic example is the Ukraine flag emoji. Right? So everybody thinks a thing, and you want to make sure everybody right away knows, they, without even reading, that you know, you're in agreement with a certain thought or idea. And that, I think that's a new thing. It's a protective thing that, that has come up in this age when people feel like um, everything they do is being recorded. I mean, that's, and then that's another thing about this that I, I didn't get to, which is that uh, these systems of what they call denialists, that, that, that trans blacklist that Jay Bhattacharya got on, that's part of like these algorithms that they're, they've, they've created uh, where if you have you know, half of your comments or, or a third of your comments are seen as offensive in a certain way, then you will, you will, be, you will go in one bucket. If another, if you have re retweeted the wrong news story too many times, that will give you other points. This is similar to the system that they use. I know this is going to sound crazy, but it's similar to the system they use to decide who, uh, which people to drone. Is it a military-aged male? Is he carrying something that looks like a weapon? Uh, does he have four phone numbers in his, in his uh, uh, contacts list that we don't like? Um, and you know, do we have any intelligence that, that that that's the thing that will send a message to the person who, who's in charge of you know, pressing the button? And they use something similar like that to engage in both financial surveillance, but also to put people on denial list. That's how Julian Assange got on a list called Is Russian, um, Jill Stein too. Uh, so people accumulate points, even for things like likes, uh, you know, if you like the wrong thing. And that has created this atmosphere where people know that they're being watched and this is an impact. Uh, just to give you an example, you know, they recently found out that uh, some of the banks are monitoring MCC code, MCC codes for transactions. So, uh, if you make purchases at gun stores or if you buy sporting goods at Cabela's, you're going to get points, and that's going to lead to this sort of anti-money laundering system kind of computation, where eventually you might be denied banking services, you might be denied, denied payment processing services, and all of this is part of this kind of overarching digital surveillance thing that is increasingly part of our lives that people are accepting. I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm going on, but you know, but, but, that, but that is why people are afraid to be quiet, and that's why they will, be, they will start to make gestures. So I, wanna, I, I actually took a note that's similar to what was just being discussed on the Gospel of Nice. But what I would say is that's the effect of, and I'm going to get a little ridiculous, but I'm hopefully going to try to make a point here, is uh, that's the psyop that's affecting the public on how we act. And the gospel of nice, you can have, with that gospel of nice, we have to be nice to everybody. There's a good societal reason to be nice, but then you come out of that with the influence of someone saying both, out of both sides of their mouth at the same time, silence is violence and, and speech is violence. Mm -hmm. and, and so you get, you, know, you get the control of the public. My concern with this is not is what comes before that, which is what you investigated, because I look at this as all of this is 
based on bureaucracy. And that metastasizes into our government. And this happened, if you think about this, the circumstances that made this, just you figuring this out. And I know it wasn't just you figuring this out, but, but how this came to be were a set of circumstances that a year before that were unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And it would still go on. And to think that this isn't going on, it's like, I, that's where I, I go. Do we not read the Constitution? <laughs> right. That's my concern. I don't, I don't get how we as Americans just passively go, yeah, I'm okay with it. Right? Yeah. I mean, that, uh, sorry, what, what, what's your name? Dan. Dan. So, well, when I was growing up, the whole idea of any obnoxious person having, you know, having their First Amendment rights violated for any reason, even if you don't agree with them, you're supposed to be, that's supposed to be a serious cause for concern because, you know, you know what's coming next, right? Like, once, once they're allowed to get away with that once, the, you know, it, they'll expand their purview. And, you know, there's this whole idea that there is no such thing as a slippery slope anymore, and you will hear that argued all the time. But in this case, we see, we saw a very rapid progression of, you know, from, from very, very small measures to massive, sort of systematic measures. This is one thing that I skipped over, but I first started covering this story in 2018. Uh, people might not remember this, but um, after Alex Jones got taken off uh, the internet, which, by the way, was a historic and, and interesting thing because of how it happened, not because of who it was, but this idea that companies would get together and non-competitively decide to prevent uh, that from happening. Well, the Senate called Facebook in, and this was after threatening them with increased regulation, and said, we would like you to work with the Atlantic Council um, and its Digital Forensic Research Laboratory. Um, and the Atlantic Council is a massively militarily funded think tank that's also the beneficiary of funding from all kinds of third world repressive countries, uh, a lot of American foreign policy partners, and the Atlantic Council paired up with Facebook, and there was a little tiny news entry in late August of 2018. Um, first they announced that they were partnering with Facebook, and then they said, taking down more coordinated authentic behavior. And does anybody remember this? The purge? They took the uh, Facebook just one day just zapped 800 sites, or a little over 800 sites. You know, and some of them were junk sites, but some of them were real small businesses that had spent hundreds, you know, in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars on Facebook ads building up their, their um, readerships. And they weren't radicals. They were, among other things, sites like Police the Police and Cop Block. Right? And there were sites that were doing things like putting videos of police brutality up on the web. And nobody cared because this was in the era of hysteria about Russian interference. And even within the news business, you know, I had this problem. I was talking to other journalists and saying, this is, this is crazy. We can't just let them, you know, destroy small media organizations without any kind of due process. But... You know, a few years after this, what happens? The, you know, people are being taken off the internet all the time now, and then there's no explanation for it. There's no, there's no argument about it. People have just accepted it as a fact of their lives. And I don't know. Does that scare anybody else? That really makes me nervous. You know. Well, I'm just, I'm just one more comment because I'm yeah. still holding the mic. Um, <laughs> is uh, all this to me? I look at all this comes back to power and money. That's what all this is. If you look at if you look at those organizations, even the NGOs, the, the Stanford's, is, they were getting money from the federal government, and and we we're sitting in a big place that gets a whole bunch of money from the federal government. And as long as those things are allowed to happen, and somebody tell me how, tell me what's really changed. Tell me, because I've watched you in front of Congress and Lee Long and. and you know, and it's like, I don't have any 
confidence that they're going to change anything. No, I mean, and, and they've, they've been very smart about um, getting money to all the major uh, institutions so that everybody gets a little piece of this thing. And one of the, one of the reasons we even looked at GEC uh, the first time was because we didn't know what it was. We saw there was a dispute in, inside Twitter. Like, some of them didn't like the GEC people personally. They're like, these people are annoying. They call too much. Um, well, what's GEC? You know, so we, we looked up and we found this Inspector General report that talked about how GEC one year got like $98 million in funding. And there were some really bizarre anomalies just in that information. Like, uh, all, almost 80 million of that came from the Department of Defense. And I'm thinking, what, you know, why would the State Department need to get DOD money to do this weird program? And then they talked about how they had 39 different contractors who were doing um, this work. And you turn the page and to look at the list of contractors, and all but three of them were redacted. So I've spent the last year sending FOIAs to like every university in the country, and I've started to find that a lot of them, especially the state universities, are getting pieces of these anti-disinformation programs. They get, they get fed some of this work. They, they do subcontracting for some of these uh, outlets. And I can't help but think that that's part of the reason why you don't hear a whole lot of objection to this. It's just like military research back in the day, right? I'm going to follow up on that. Are the bias response um, programs that are from campus, well, this campus, and all campuses part of this? I, I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't think that's. I don't think so. That's a good question. I mean, these groups seem to be very, very focused on stuff that appears online, uh, but um, but they're certainly taking their direction about. Uh, what kinds of things constitute hate speech and uh, from certain groups. They've also adopted a lot of the language of certain, you know, fashionable movements at the moment. Uh, but I don't, I don't know that they're really involved in, like, on-the-ground policies at, at colleges. They do say an awful lot of weird stuff about, um, you know, how we have to be combating what they call, like, despair-inducing MDM. So we're not just allowed to be, they don't want us to be, you know, wrong, but they also don't want us to be sad for any reason. <laughs> it's really weird. I'll actually find that it's just such a strange thing that, uh, yeah, despair-inducing MDM. Uh, we want to empower individuals to be resilient against despair-inducing I have no idea why that's the government's job, but apparently it is. Um. Yeah, um, I, uh, I help admin like a small time like news is your website, people like talk to us from about a lot less followers. But like we've known this has been going on. This is just when I mean, you look at the analytics, it doesn't make sense. Like we post something about Ukraine. We use the word Taliban, and it's fine for like a good month or two, and then it gets flagged, and then a few posts gets flagged. Those are like, this, is, this all makes sense, but when this came out and you're doing this work, I was like, you hoping, hoping that something would happen, nothing happened. And then, I mean, me and a lot of other people that, a lot of other accounts that are in this campaign got this fierce attitude because no one cares. Right. And I'm a journalist student at IC, and when I bring this up in my classes, I get like right in the seats a lot of uncomfortable faces. So I just don't know what to do anymore because well, it's... this is great. What, what do people say about it? I mean, uh, like, I can't even get my old friends to talk about this issue anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's really it's, weird. It's, I, I don't, because I don't know if you think that, like, this is, you know, American free speech. You, you say what you want, but it's almost like, I think, I mean, I think I was a left leaning campus, and I think that. A lot of the fake news stuff is directed more toward right-wing circles. Yes, but look, okay, just to take an example, um, you know, so, so Julian Assange is really one of the first people who fell into the maw of this thing, right? They, they figured out that they were all, you know, in, in addition to um, 
you know, planning stories about him that they could apply pressure points like, you know, not letting him use PayPal, which is now a very common method of going after people who have unpopular political opinions. You might remember the Canadian truckers, right? They, you know, give send go, and then they'll they'll move on to the next organization that tries to allow them to raise money. They did this to people who were um, merely defendants in the J6 cases, right? They hadn't even been convicted yet, but they convinced payment processors to, to not work with them anymore. But this started with, you know, the, as always, as is usually the case, this this activity was kind of tested on the left first, right? Like the, the Palestinian even movements, right? There, there were um, groups, there was a partnership between the Mossad and Facebook that was concluded in 2015. I think people are wrong about this, you know? I think they, they see this as a right-wing issue, uh, but I think that's just propaganda, you know? Um, and I don't know how to penetrate it, because what, what, as soon as you start talking about it, they code it as a right-wing thing, and then, you know. So uh, it's frustrating. That, that has, anything I say in class, I can preface that I'm not with these people. Right. right? And it's really annoying, because I, I feel like I'm playing semantics when I'm trying to get the core issue, and I get bogged down in all the like, oh, yeah, extra stuff. And they don't believe you when you say it, right? Yeah, I don't believe you when you say it. Yeah. So, See, I wish some of those folks would come, you know what I mean? Like, that's what I, I want to write. Yeah. <laughs> I tried doing the same thing with Tim Cornell. Mm -hmm. I invited the communications department, the government department, the First Amendment clinic, the law school. Uh, the First Amendment clinic. Yeah. Hey, yeah, you know what they, how they answer? Look, I'm, I'm, I'm terrified to hear it. What did you say? Oh, I thought I said it. He didn't. They didn't answer. They didn't answer. Oh, okay. Crickets. Crickets make more noise. Crickets. Yeah. So, so, so there, there seems to be a uh, theme from Jecter that, well, so so the, the right gets blamed as, as the reason why there's so much disinformation a lot of the time. But as you point out, it's not necessarily coming from right wing associated groups. It could be considered really left wing, far left wing. Absolutely. And what's happened is there seems to be a circle where the right and the left on, 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 on certain elements have joined together and the information on either side is being categorized as information the government does not want the people to have. Right. And so that's where it's, where it's most problematic is that you've got people that are generally consider themselves in the left wing camp or the right wing camp and so they would be generally distrustful of other camps and therefore if, if the news comes out of left wing sort of now it's called mainstream left wing I think everything is mainstream now is it's got a left wing salt to it in many respects. So you might disagree, but but the point is that it's controlling a lot of the news. I mean now it's which mainstream, yeah. right? Mainstream media is and with the exception of, of a, a few few notable outlets that are that consider themselves uh, to be on the side of it. But the, uh, the irony is though that the they're doing as much towards filtering information and, 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 and they're not doing their job as sort of the free, the arbiters of free speech and, and, and the purveyors and, and, and guarantors of free speech. Whereas you say people are, are maybe uh, afraid to speak out or don't speak out or you're not hearing enough people speaking out because you can't imagine why they wouldn't be. Well, it's because, I think you've already said this, but the institutions that, that are basically from our founding in place to um, basically, at least if nothing else, represent the various opinions, they're not representing them. So we're not hearing from the uh, concerned dissenters of, of the, the limitation on free speech because they're being limited in many cases, if not afraid to speak out, as was pointed out today, that there is uh, people get prosecuted and threatened um, and, and all these different uh, or or, or, or non-GMO or, or job, you know, people you know, get threatened at, at their workplace or something like that, if they speak up. But it doesn't seem to matter as much as if it's uh, sort of right-wing or left-wing, it is the topic. If it, if it goes against the, uh, I guess you could call it the, the, the acceptable, maybe governmental, you know, authority. And unfortunately, now we've discovered that this acceptable is coming from the right side and the left side. 
whether you're a Democratic elected or a Republican elected, in many cases we're finding the same tactics being used to limit the same types of, of information, which is information that goes against whatever they're trying to prevent. Right. And that's the scariest thing, is that the government is controlling what is acceptable thought and, and, and what is acceptable speech. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's the big, the big red flag, it seems like. It's not whether it's coming on the left or the right. Right. I think with the, the old school left, right, mm -hmm. and, the right and, 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 and the old school right, they actually are more similar in some, in some respects than a lot of whatever this thing is now. It's sort of controlling the entities, you know, the controlling entities. Absolutely, you know, that, that's a great point, and, and they get around that by pretending there is no such thing as a, as a legitimate kind of you know, left of subjection to all of this, right? And they just say that whoever those people are, they're actually just closet, right, wingers. Um, so even people like Dennis Kucinich, and somebody who I consulted with a lot during the during Robert time. Kennedy Jr. Robert Kennedy Jr. I mean, you know, look, he's, he's got some views on vaccines that are controversial, but again, I, I don't see him as a right winger exactly, right? Uh, and the, what they're doing though, and Kennedy's a great example, is they're, they decide to make an issue out of um, correctitude, uh, whether or not something is scientifically accurate or not, based they start with who you are and then they move to, to the analysis. So, you know, a lot of the, the major news organizations have had very poor records on factual accuracy about all kinds of things uh, in the last five years. Even during the course of the Twitter files, you know, we found out all kinds of things that they were wrong about, like this Hamilton 68 websites and there were a million of these stories about Russian bots that turned out to be completely manufactured. Now, they won't say that this, the, the outlets that did those stories are fake news purveyors or, you know, are misinformationists or unreliable. Um, you know, outlets like NewsGuard, which get funded by you know, Pentagon or whatever it is, you know, but they will, those organizations will give demerits to, you know, the Washington Examiner or whatever it is, right? And then in this way, they create this impression that all of the misinformation is coming from one place and not the other. And if you object to it, that means you have secret sympathies. And it's, it's a very effective propaganda thing. Um, I'm a senior here, and I'm a government major, so I got I got the memo, but apparently the rest of the department didn't. So uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. It took me like five minutes today to find where this was. So it's like <laughs> racing around in my car. Um, but regardless, um, after watching your month debate with Malcolm Gladwell and Michelle Goldberg, I believe mm -hmm. I kind of had this moment where I was like, if these people aren't getting it, I mean, you just kept having to repeat your point over and over again about defying the mainstream media. Uh, establishing its collusion with the U.S. government, uh, these communication agencies and all these things. Um, I've kind of lost hope, so there's my despair inducing comment. As, as, a, as an aspiring young journalist, I'd like to think that you know there is some respect for truth, but uh, even in you know classes here, I'm not some radical, unfortunately, down the center with most things, but uh, even last week I mentioned Twitter files as an important reference point in uh, the disinformation kind of tapestry that a professor of mine was trying to read. And she said, well, the Twitter files are kind of these random reports, and uh, you know, they don't really matter that much, they don't have many implications. And I just don't understand, you know, I, I, I agree with your point, saying, you know, I can't find these people who've been going around who really want to debate it. And everyone seems to have the same point, from Malcolm Gladwell to this non professor, uh, who say, if this were true, I believe you, you know, I would fight against this and all this stuff, but it's not, so I don't need to fight against it. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you have any idea of what that final push would be, because some of this stuff seemed to be, you know, a natural succession from the Snowden reporting to all these things, and yet it's just disregarded flat out by most, you know, academics here in the government department and stuff. Yeah. Not taken seriously. So I'm curious what you think about that. That's a really good question. I mean, I, I mean think back to 2013, 2014, who was more unpopular than 
the NSA and the CIA, right? People were up in arms, like, oh my god, they're collecting all our information? Like, we didn't give you permission to do that. And then they sent those people, you know, James Clapper and John Brennan to Congress. They lied. They, they kind of took, no. in, in, you know, they were no. snatching information from Senate aides' computers and stuff like that. And, um, and you know, people were upset about it, right? But there was this moment, I think, when, when, when Trump happened in America, I think, you know, the agencies really successfully presented that they rebranded themselves. As, we, we're going to protect you from that, you know, and I think they've done a good job, you know, of, of hiding behind it, kind of using Trump as a human shield, basically. Um, you know, all of those old past sins, people have forgotten about them because, and Snowden, you know, is still not allowed back in this country, and um, you know, Assange is going to die in prison, and uh, people are okay with that because they're they're now in this other mental place where they're terrified of this other thing, and they don't they don't have mental energy for this. But I I think, you know, what they don't understand is that these these things are linked, right? Like the 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 anger that people feel um, that leads them to vote for somebody like Donald Trump comes from the arrogance that you see that bleeds through in, in these communications. It's this idea that we know better than you, right? Like, you know, we're going to make these decisions for you because um, you're not competent to do that, right? You know, I think that's why the Twitter files resonated for a certain part of the country and not for another. Um, and it's a, if people don't understand, if they don't recognize this as a, as a serious policy issue, which they should, because it's like the next stage in the evolution of you know, the military-industrial nightmare, which keeps growing. Um, they should recognize it as a political problem, because the, the, this, this whole thing, I think, just it, it, it continues to widen. Right? Doesn't that, does that make sense? I mean, the, 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 pe the people who are, who, to whom this makes sense, are the people who feel like they're, they're at, being, at risk of being taken off the internet. And there's another group of people who don't feel like that, right? And so, yeah. Experiment. Any other Cornell students that didn't get the memo? This is cool, though. Yeah. yeah. So th this is um, what you hear is exactly right. Mm -hmm. So um, I was, I noticed a faculty <coughs> member pulling out COVID and still students there. Really? So is this? No, oh, yeah, but there are folks. Don't, don't feel left out. Your folks have been taken down too. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, although they're always taken down next to the elevator, which makes me think that the people that are taken down is really low. <laughs> I was in the cafe today and I said, oh, I was talking to a friend who's not political at all. I said, you have to come to this talk. This is so exciting. He goes, I don't care about the U.S. government. I was like, all right, well, you're a lot of things anyways. But then this kid behind me goes, well, why would you want to listen to him? He just is the Twitter virus guy. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I said, you should come and listen, and maybe you'll figure some stuff out. But, wow. yeah, it was just, there's such a bias, I feel like, that's everywhere. Yeah. I think it's good that the bias is better explained by the people that want to sense it. Don't trust the average person to make their own decisions. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And secondly, when you ask them to explain themselves, they have no ability. So they're really stupid. Well, they're looking for power. Yeah. And, and yeah. the First Amendment clinic people, <laughs> come tell me why I'm wrong. And, and the lack of self-awareness is kind of amazing. I mean, like, one of, I'm sorry to pick up that, there's one little vignette from the Twitter files that still blows me away. We found this thing about uh, a tabletop exercise that was held at the Aspen Institute um, before the 2020 election where a whole bunch of prominent journalists got together and they basically planned um, how to respond to a potential story about a hack and leak operation involving Hunter Biden and Burisma. This was like a month before that story came out. And it's like all the Washington Post, New York Times, like, you know, Vox, like, they're all there, and they're planning to not cover this thing. But the fascinating thing about it is that the Washington Post, there, there was a, an academic paper 
that was circulated before this to um, the people at this conference, and it talked about going away from what they call the Pentagon Papers Principle, which is, um, you know, where the Pentagon Papers Principle is, it's true, let's publish it. Um, the new idea is, let's worry more about provenance than content. So, where did it come from? Who gave you this information? What were their motives in putting it out there? And this is the Washington Post rejecting the Pentagon Papers Principle um, right after they put out a movie called The Post, celebrating their, sorry, I just, that stuff drives me crazy. <laughs> So, um, I got banned from advertising for life on Facebook. I'm a local acupuncturist. And um, they would never, I could actually, first of all, I could never actually reach a human being. Um, it was a couple of uh, emails. And it was ironic, this is the same kind of Facebook ad department that tries to encourage businesses that they think are going to do well uh, to curtail, to, to actually improve their advertising. So I was giving like this thumbs up and someone wanted to help me on Facebook and then I sent an email I got basically regarding the uh, censor. And I, the only thing I can think of was was an article that I had on how Chinese medicine approaches epidemics and Chinese medicine is involved with epidemics. The right word uh, uh, medicine in Chinese is even pronounced the same term as epidemic. Wow. And so the article was just about Chinese medicine's approach without anything about uh, you know that submission whatsoever. And for that, I, I've been banned for, for life and advertising in Facebook. That's yeah. So I think it's a deeper question than just power versus power. You know, you brought that up. I think it's um, why does everyone else go along with it? Why do the higher educated groups, you know, this is a flat number for the class trader? You know, I used to be here, graduated 29 years ago. And I was a religious studies major because I was interested in um, how people's beliefs inform their choices. I think this is what this is about. We need to look at the fact that humanism uh, uh, arose at the same time as the witch hunts. And this is basically following the same sort of model of witch hunt. And because my medicine and my science doesn't conform with whatever the received sciences of the day, it's considered to be witchcraft and therefore it's censored. So, so my, my answer to that is isn't the whole idea of America is that we and that are forward people who have unorthodox and even totally insane ideas, and that's yes. one of our strengths. I mean, you know, from the Seventh Day Adventists, I mean, whatever, right? The Millerite uh, predictions to lay a trail to what, I mean, that can be criminal, but um, this, America has always, our strength has always been innovation and, and freedom and all these things. Ideas, right? Yeah, and you can't have those if they're predetermined. I, it, and, and so it's, um, I think this is just all going in a very ugly direction where it's 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 conformism versus nonconformism, um, and, and a class thing, right? It's like a mixture of those yeah, things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because the, the more education you have, the more expert you're deemed to be, and therefore whatever you say is supposed to be the orthodoxy, and who should question that? And that's really the mindset that we think that we're all kind of, that's the, you know, the mindset that we're living in. Right, right, it's credentialism. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, in uh, reading this and seeing this, it feels like it's such an ubiquitous thing within the government that it really just makes me question what can we as regular people, regular people, do about this? That is a very difficult question because you, there are almost no consumer choices left that you can make, right? Normally, as you know, the one thing you can do is vote with your pocketbook, but this is a cartel, basically. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons that they, they were so upset with Elon Musk is, and he's, as I've discovered, you know, not exactly Christine on free speech, free speech issues. He's got his own ideas, but but he's not cooperating. But uh, you know, you saw what happened with sites like Parler. You know, if when they tried to drop out of whatever the thing is, um, you know, they will, you know, Apple and Amazon will get together and say, well, we're going to deny you these services if you don't, and you can't put the app for sale over here. 
and next thing you know, they're adopting the same code. Um, you know, some other sites, for instance, um, you know, that try that uh, don't follow this, the normal standards about like what kinds of pornographic behavior they're going to publish. The credit card companies will let them know um, you can't do this, you can't do that. We we'll, we'll work this out amongst ourselves. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's a difficult thing, and I don't particularly trust that one party or the other is going to really, really be there on the end on this. I think you saw after after the Gaza thing, no matter what you think about that, that a lot of people who were free speech advocates before that suddenly had a change of heart uh, about that um, issue afterward. Uh, but I don't know. What do you think? I mean, like, what what, what can people do? They can they can try to. Um, you know, talk to their congressperson, but I also think that meeting in person is going to have to be a new thing in the internet age. Like we got out of the habit of doing that. Yes. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you know I wanted to do this is like we have to get in the habit of talking to each other again, uh, and not just kind of sending our feeling, you know, our statements um, because you know we're, we're, this is easily mechanized. This is. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So my, my, my podcast partner has a newspaper that you actually have to get delivered. Um, he, he, yeah, Walter. Yeah, uh, and this is this is a specific way of getting around this problem. Um, I have Stone got around this problem um, because there was a distribution monopoly. He just decided to use the U.S. mail and stamps. Um, so, but. You know, this, this thing is very sophisticated and there's a ton of money behind it and, you know, and it, it, it's, it also, it's intersecting with other forms of um, social control that they're experimenting with, like, you know, financial surveillance, what are you buying, you know, what kind of people can do, banking, et cetera, et cetera. So that's scary and I think they're going to take it to some new places. You had mentioned a suite of tools that, that Twitter had, where you you were given access to this one page and you could go in and see all this stuff. Did that exist before um, the government started asking Twitter to report on this? In other words, had, had uh, Jack, whatever, crazy, whatever he's got. Of yeah. Or, did he invent that, or was that sort of invented by request of the government? That's a really interesting question. I don't know the answer to that question. You know, I remember I talked to, I knew somebody who was a fairly high-ranking um, Facebook executive who worked more on the ad side. Uh, and until the mid-2000s, you know, Facebook, they create so much content. I mean, it's four billion pieces of content a day or whatever it is. There's no way to actually physically look at all this stuff. And they don't. You know, it was hard enough to create programs that did things like catch... Um, you know, child pornography, and you know, they have the they even there they had the occasional error, right? Like Facebook accidentally took down the famous picture of the running girl in Vietnam, um, but they didn't want to be involved in that. That was they were very clear to me that that was not something that they wanted to be in the business of, of doing. Um, but somewhere between then and this, uh, you know, I, they created this whole system. Of deny listing, which apparently is much more um, intricate than the uh, than the promotional side. The promotional side is a sales wing of the company. You're you're selling ways to to get boosted. This other thing about you know shrinking access is something they develop themselves. But they have like sixty different levers that they can apply. Um, you know. You know, invisible like one of them is like search invisibility, so like you know, or follower invisibility, so people who follow you can't see you unless they expressly search go through your site. Um, so, uh, and then on the flip side, like if they if some, somebody is paying a lot of money to promote a book, uh, I heard a story from Amazon, for instance. Like everybody at Amazon got a notice about Michelle Obama's new book. Um, and, you know, other books, you, know, you, you can't even find if you look for them, right? So, 
I don't know when they developed it, but this this whole thing, you know, I think we we, fa we found that they started to talk to Twitter about these issues in like 2017. So I'm guessing that's probably right around when it started. But that's a good question. That would be an area of interest. Uh, yeah, thank you for all this uh, information. And I just wanted to uh, ask I guess comment on your first when you're first saying you're surprised that you didn't get you didn't get you didn't get the reaction you thought you would um, based on the Twitter files and I feel like it's probably because the people who like know about all of these things are like afraid of like the consequences because they understand like what they are and I was just wondering what you thought about that. The, the, you think the people who or like so say like a person like me like in high school I'm really good about like Snowden or like for example. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, like, even today, like, just when you get really deep into the stuff, like, like reading, like, actually like, what this, what it means and all, you see, like, oh, your account could be taken down, like, you can't advertise for your business, or maybe you can't get a job in the future, and uh, I feel like that kind of, like, suppresses people, I guess. And then, and then people like me, like, who are at Cornell, like, afraid of, like, getting kicked out, I guess. That's a good point. That's depressing if it's true, but... But there's, you know, there's been a progression. Think about it. Glenn Greenwald won an Oscar for doing this known story, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then uh, just a few years later, he's infamous. Um, some, I, I just think that there's been some kind of ineffable change in our psychology, and I, I, don't, I just don't know what it is. I, you know, I, maybe it's Trump? Does anybody think it's Trump? I, mean, I, I think it's fear, and they're using Trump as a, as a vehicle. I think fear closes off so much of the ability to reason and be open to other opinions. Right. And when we're afraid, we get very short-sighted and narrow-focused. We don't, we don't examine what's at the periphery of what we know. Right. I think that's a big problem. That's a big problem. Right, right. Well, yeah. It's not a coincidence that Trump and Bernie showed up at the same time. Oh, no, of course not. No, and Bernie, Bernie had his own problems. We, you know, we didn't look for them, but um, you know, he didn't make the is Russian list. Um, but we found, you know, the, the, the Global Engagement Center, the Democratic Socialists had some issues. They would they would turn up on this some of the lists that we found. We didn't find Bernie Sanders specifically. But we found him. I mean, it's just as a you were saying with the report, it, it's not really a left or a right thing. I, it's it's a it's an insider outsider thing. You know, Bernie ran an outsider campaign. Um, he didn't appeal to. He didn't use corporate money. You know, he used individual donations and was the top fundraiser, which was a, a huge proof of concept um, that had never been done. Um, you know, so he he was he was dangerous in the same way that Trump is. But Trump. But, Trump represents something that's absolutely horrifying to these folks. And they, they are, I think they are unable to distinguish between the legitimate electoral movement and, um, you know, an in, in, in illegitimate rebellion based on misinformation. They think that people vote that way they must be misinformed. Same thing. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm guessing. But. So you and I actually know that a dozen years on some casual contacts, uh, maybe tonight I'll tell you about it. Um, I've labored over this. I, I probably average two hours of podcasts a day as an invited guest, and I can tell you that the world is going crazy with the issues you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The kind of podcasts are out there, there's a big deal with this. There's people in this room who will also testify that I, I don't filter. Mm -hmm. and, and so, one of the questions I've had is, I don't know why I'm still on I mean, I've been going against every one of these hot politicians. I, I checked your Twitter feed, by the way. You are being stepped on. Oh. Your uh, follower to like ratio is way out of line. Yeah. Um, but I know why that is. <laughs> yes, you do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have found it most helpful for me, and again, it's taken a dozen years. We go back to the Vampire School days. So it's taken years. I, I, I've taken to reading. First of all, I want to warn the young guys, be careful about going out with rabbit holes. you got to learn how to make robots and stuff. And, and if you go down these rabbit holes, you can ruin your life, even with the old guys or something. Um, I 
find it useful to uh, to read about rising authoritarianism. So whether it's whether it's Eric Hopper and Aaron um, 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 Edward Bernays back in the nineteen twenties, more recently someone like Mike Malice or, or Matthias Nesman. Mm -hmm. um, what you find is two common traits when an authoritarian state is rising in power. They are um, confusion and demoralization. And if there's anyone in this room who's not confused and demoralized, I'll be surprised. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what happened, my working hypothesis is that when the internet showed up, uh, they, the, the government, the, gov the one thing the government agrees always from generation to generation is they want to be in control. And, and the right and the left both agree on that. And so I think when the internet showed up, it also became a so I think the battle for the internet where it was democracy's greatest hope and worst enemy. Um, and that's why I think we're seeing such a garish response to people's opinions. So it seems to me it's all about self-censorship. So I don't think cancel culture is something that emerged out of nowhere. I, I think it was created. I'm one of the lucky few at Cornell who's been canceled with enthusiasm. And I'll tell you, it was a painful experience, but the next time they try, I'm coming out with shotguns. Um, <laughs> And I keep baiting them, but I think they've given up on me. Uh, I have stayed at Colin Cornell Chemistry, by the way. Um, and, and, and so if you look at these characters, like, for example, Robert Woodward was, before he was a journalist, he was CIA. They could control the legal and Good enough. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I, so, so I think it is an attempt to, to create self censorship. Because that's a generalized concept that can be applied to any topic. Mm -hmm. So if you're afraid to speak up, and what I can tell you is I'm less afraid to speak up at 68 as a tenured professor in battle scholar. So, so I speak up. The mayor and some others can't. Mm -hmm. Most of them can't. Mm -hmm. And you do. But, but if you, you self-censor, then, then just you don't need to be canceled. You just need to threat of cancellation. So I, I actually think it was an astroturf movement. And, uh, and again, I sucked with shotguns while, while they were canceling me. And I was emotionally, I didn't think a Cornell student would show up, but I thought I had tea for money. And I knew for a fact that I was going to go into the light with someone. <laughs> <laughs> and I stand by that. And I say that on podcasts, and I'm not afraid to say it. Right, right. And, and so they keep, it, it's demoralization. Nothing makes sense. So, um, I'm not going to tell this in public. I'm going to write about it someday. I'll tell you at dinner. But I have a theory as to why we're getting people who look like they should support the basic principles of our system that are now failing. And part of it's how authoritarianism arrives. But part of it's something much more insidious, and I'll throw that at you at dinner. Okay, yeah. You want me to say so, it? No, so, no. <laughs> 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 just, just quickly, I want to use just a quick, quick report uh, to that. Um, you know, I, I did campaign journalism for many years. Right, I was I started with Rolling Stone in two thousand four, traveling with the candidates for you know over and over and over again. I hated the story. I thought it was so boring. And the reason it was boring is because um, it was so rigidly controlled. The whole problem with American presidential elections is that there's no spontaneity like. Whoever the donors, the party, and the press agreed would be the nominee, that person would be the nominee. Then in 2016, Donald Trump, you know, the journalists tried to kill him after the McCain thing. I was, I mean, I was on the plane when this happened. They were like, oh, he's got to go. Um, but he had a Twitter account, and he was able to bypass us to go directly to people. And this was a proof of concept that showed that the internet could be, a, you know, an, an anarchistic tool. You know, we had, they, had, they had already seen it in the Arab Spring, that it was something that could, in, in a heartbeat, take down very repressive regimes. Why are you flammable to Exactly. And so that's why I think they're so freaked out by this. That's one thing I'll say. The other thing is, podcasts, you know, one of the amazing things we found is, is there was a, 
another Aspen Institute conference that was like Katie Quirk and Prince Harry and somebody else were leading that was at that time. Um, but they were deeply concerned, like that one of the, the reforms that they were really anxious to implement was making sure that every kind of content on the internet could be instantly transcribed for real-time surveillance in case you know anybody said thing something that was out of turn. That's why I remember Taylor Lorenz in the New York Times was doing these stories about oh my god the dangers of Clubhouse. People are saying things right without any monitoring. Like how can we have that? So well but but you know she was she was onto a trend that was that I think that's a real thing. They they don't there's going to be a movement against anything that can't be instantly digitized. Um, and that's why, why, again, I talk about talking in person. Um, we're going to end up doing it. It's going to be like Stalin Russia, where you go home at night and you put the covers up or talk to your wife um, you know, in bed. Uh, that is going to be, the, the goal is to make sure that everything is digitizable and algorithmically analyzed, you know, Su su subject to that, that kind of analysis, and you know, that's the future, I think. And, and, they're, and it's going to be combined, not just with all your speech history, and that's the danger of things like this, is CPIL and EIP, is that they're not just looking at what you say on Facebook, they're looking at what you say on all the different platforms, and each one is contributing to a big kitty in the middle that is creating, you know, kind of, not, an informal general scoring system. So, so yes, it's your cell phone listening to you all the time. I'm absolutely certain it is. Yeah. Snowden is. Oh. When he gets a cell phone, he cuts the microphone out. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, I, I reached him once. <laughs> and I made the mistake of entering in my phone that I, that I had his number, and I get like a call. Don't do that, right? So <laughs> basically, you're like, you know, make sure that it's under somebody else's name. But yeah, no, I mean, everything in our house, Alexa's listening to us, right? Like, I mean, how, how far away are we from that stuff becoming admissible in court cases? And, you know, I don't think that far, right? So, not to be too dramatic about it, but the, I, I just think that all this stuff, if you, if you do happen to get into a discussion with Anybody who, does, who, th who thinks all this stuff is nonsense, I would just say, like, you know, encourage them to look at it from the point of view of not left, you know, Democrats and Republicans, but this is this is FBI, CIA, and whatever against citizens. against citizens. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. For sure. For sure. We're already in place that's kind of like that, you know, I mean, I interviewed somebody who, again, was a, um, a defendant for being at J6, and just every service in the world, you can imagine, was stripped before he was convicted, you know, I mean, the, the instant generation of all kinds of civil suits, everything, um, and, you know, that's, that's going to be how this works, like, you, you, get, you get put on a list, that's why those lists that I was showing are dangerous because they're transferable to other things, right? Like what happens when they start sending that to the anti-money laundering services or FinCEN or whatever it is? When, uh, you know, we start cross-referencing and that's when you end up with a problem. But anyway, thank you so much everybody for uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to call Jim Anybody need to acupuncture? <laughs> You're actually covering students, grad students in, in the uh, uh, chat.